Welcome to The Rot Focus, a podcast for rotters, newbies, and veterans, and everyone in between. We're hosted by M.A. Lee with the assistance of Remy Black and Edie Rooms, all from Rotters Inc. Books. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Each episode lasts as long as it takes to fix a quick dinner, grab a short commute, or take a brisk walk. Resources and links are in the show notes. Visit us at therockfocus.blogspot.com. Now, on to this week's episode. Here we are with more techniques from Earl Stanley Gardner. We're tackling Gardner's solutions for writer's block. Look to the show notes for information about the nonfiction book that is the source for this information. On my first read-through of this writing life biography of Gardner's, I saw nothing on writer's block, not in the table of contents, not in the extremely well-done index, not in headings within chapters. It's there, though, unmentioned, and its very lack of mention is proof that Gardner stumbled over those barriers. Prolific as he was, he had to develop methods, techniques, to defeat writer's block before it could grab him by the shirt and toss him into the cactus and onto the hard rocks of the Baja, California areas that he so loved and often visited. Gardner's mind was highly analytical, and the notebook habit of recording, analyzing, and synthesizing into something new suited his mind. By 1940, 15 years and more into his writing life, he wrote a four-point list entitled Notes and Rules on Work. From page 18 in the book, one, to write good stories, I have to have my mind exclusively on these stories. The minute I start thinking of other things, the less effective my story work becomes. This single-minded project focus of his point one, lessons distractions. When I began my own steady commitment to writing, I first tried to spend Sunday to Tuesday on one fiction project and Wednesday to Thursday on a second fiction project with Saturday on whichever called to me. My plan was wrong. First, because Saturday depended on inspiration for the choice. We writers never wait on inspiration. It should wait on us. Second, by splitting my time between two projects, I split my conscious and unconscious attention. On Monday, I might get an idea for project two, then force myself to wait for Wednesday to develop that idea. By being split, the unconscious mind didn't know how to weave its creative threads. The unconscious is where creativity lies. Two projects kept it tangled, which needed detangled before it was entangled. A better work habit is a single focus on one project, only pursuing a second project when we need a breakaway. Gardner's second point is this. Do the bulk of my plotting on paper, he writes in his notebook. Other kind makes for aimless thinking. Gardner means writing by hand, not typing which simply leads to staring at a blank page in the typewriter or, these days, on the computer screen. There is freedom in sitting with a legal pad and pen and simply jotting or sketching ideas. Before our conscious mind realizes it, we've composed a scene. Paper and pen gives us freedom to fly, to scratch out, make errors rather than delete, to make mistakes but move on. This is prime and pure creativity, brain straight to hand. Forming letters awakens both sides of the brain, and we need both sides, the creative and the logical, to compose stories from nothing. I've written whole pages, then put a big X on the pages, only to mine those ideas for a later scene in that book. The creative muse gave them for a reason. Maybe the ideas are too early. Maybe they go earlier. At least with pen and paper, the ideas remain, undeleted, unscrewed up and tossed away. Third, Gardner writes, sleeping is a habit. 
by napping during the day and only going to bed when tired, I soon become highly irregular in my sleeping. This can't be avoided in the city at times, but on the ranch I should make it a rule not to sleep during the daytime, if possible to stay awake and be in bed by 9.30 at night. Does no good to go to bed if not sleepy, therefore plan to do something, revising or studying Chinese, which will make me sleepy an hour or so before bedtime. Napping, gardener's third ammunition, is a seductive evil that drains our writing time. In the city, he could avoid it. Away from others, he didn't, and discovered his regular sleeping became highly irregular, as he says. And he was ahead of modern scientists, prophetic even, in planning to take the hour or so before bedtime to do something that made him sleepy, studying or revising. Today, we are urged to avoid blue screens, smartphones, and computer screens, TVs, an hour before bed. All I know is that disrupted sleep causes the brain to malfunction. When we're sleep deprived, we lose motivation. We lose interest and curiosity. We merely want to doom scroll or vegetate, which led Gardner and leads us to his fourth point. He writes, my greatest trouble is aimless thinking. Cut it out. When in the study, I should either be dictating writing plots or reading, not on a time-switching basis, but on a work-all-done relaxation program, or a period of study of what's being done. Naturally, a man likes to procrastinate work, and this becomes a habit. The mind is a horse. It would rather have you chase it around the pasture than go to work. Therefore, tie it up. Make it work while it is supposed to be working until it gets the habit. Oh, my. Aimless thinking. Gardner adjured himself to dictate or plot or read when he could not actually write. Be doing something that progresses the writing business. Stop procrastinating. What was it, he said? Make it work while it is supposed to be working until it gets the habit. It's the discipline of work. By 1940, when he wrote this, Gardner was a success and would become a much greater success because he followed these rules on work. He could have napped. He could have procrastinated, but he did not want to. He wanted to be writing. And with these four points, he could be. In writing, he needed ideas, and he had discovered a secret about writing. The more we write, the more ideas we have to write. As the Fugates say on page 136 of their biography, his plotting notebooks offer ample testimony that his agile mind needed little mechanical stimulus to begin creation of a storyline. Gardner had investigated various plotting machines, as he called them, the Plot Jenny, which he tried and quickly rejected, and Plato, a 300-page book of dense writing, more like academia than a guide for a storyteller. We have software programs today that give great guidance on plot patterns and templates for character development, but the writer cannot depend alone on these crutches. They are a starting point. We have to run that writing race, and it's a marathon, not a sprint. In a letter, Gardner explains his own personal problem was plotting, developing a basic story situation with difficulties that can block any writer. At the time I purchased Plato, Gardner writes, I was groping around, writing stories which were rejected as being too weak in plot and not having enough story in them. I determined to build my plots and couldn't get to first base because I was unable to find out what a plot really was. It's easy enough to strip plots from stories and tell how the various parts have advanced the story, but that isn't constructing plots. I felt that I could solve the problem sufficiently to make my stories click if I could once find out the basic law of plot and the rules governing the development of plot. I found Plato exactly what I needed. It was through reading Plato that he discovered his primary problem. 
The author of Plato, William Wallace Cook, wrote, Purpose alone never made a situation. Obstacle alone never made one. But strike the flint of obstacle with the steel of purpose, and sparks of situation began to fly. Here, Gardner must have gotten that first insight on his past problems, the few gates tell us. Then Cook went on to state that this whole business of story construction was founded upon a law, purpose expressed or implied, opposing obstacle expressed or implied, yields conflict. That sounds so confusing to me. I can better understand Cook's charts. He had 15 of them, A clauses, protagonists or heroes, 62 B clauses, basic varieties of conflict, and 15 C clauses, things which could happen in the end. Clauses could be interchanged to make virtually an infinite number of plot variations, and clauses could be compounded or strung end on end to produce a story of any length. Quoting from Fugate's book, In simplest form, a plot would be phrased in the broadest generalities. A. A person subjected to adverse conditions. B. Seeking to overcome personal limitations in carrying out an enterprise, C, meets an experience whereby error is corrected. In the modern writing world, we think goal, motivation, and conflict, with mirrored protagonist and antagonist. How is all this a technique Gardner used and anyone can use to defeat writer's block? It's researching to learn what's giving us trouble and why and how to get around it. It's learning and applying those lessons to lift us over that blocking wall. Gardner did not have access to books and podcasts, seminars and webinars and conferences. All are learning opportunities. And through it all, even as he studied, Gardner kept writing, and so should we. Over time, Gardner developed charts and outlines comprehensive list that helped him move through stories step by step with suggested alterations in his outline of fluid or unstatic theory of plots, all quoted by the Fugates exactly. Under heading one, he has the act of primary villainy and offers such crimes as fraud, robbery, destruction, smuggling, forgery, murder, arson, and many, many more even abduction. Things that can be necessary to be stolen include gems, bribe money, just plain old stolen money, formulas, scientific formulas, computer software programs, if we put it into modern terms, letters of value, for which we can be blackmailed, rare paintings, embezzled cash, stealing from the embezzler, hoarded gold, buried cash, bullion, Evidence of a crime, stamps that have high value, stolen gems, stealing them from the fence after they were stolen from someone's house, ransom money, blackmail money, incriminating documents, smuggled stones, idols or curios, artifacts. Fifteen pages he has of alternative events, motives, causes and consequences, and results. He developed plot spinners, or plot wheels, to randomize his selection, from victims to means of death and on to clues that serve as red herrings. Anything to create an opportunity for an idea to spark. I'm certain that recording his initial ideas in a list in his plotting notebooks enabled Gardner to avoid repetition. We can use a spreadsheet or a database. It's easy to search. Some repetition can be reworked into a seemingly new event, but you can only use a bludgeon as a murder weapon a couple of times in a series before your readers will think it's passe. Or in a cozy romance, a coffee shop for a meat cute of our heroine and hero. Unless you're writing a Black Widow series. Black Widows use the same method over and over to pick their mark, lure them in, set them up, and then murder them. Hmm, that's an idea. 
but I have more ideas than I can currently write. I'm not going after that one. These spinners and charts and outlines all work for those times when we're blocked because of lack of ideas. They give us options, many options, and thus they spark ideas. The key thing to remember with charts and templates, list of tropes and genre requirements, patterns and structures, all these are opportunities for ideas and creative twist. They don't write the story for us. They can be a crutch to help us limp along, or we can use them to craft an artistic support, like a cathedral's flying buttress. So Gardner knew that a writing discipline staved off the do-nothings of writer's block, and he learned and dug out information. He used supports, charts, plot wheels, and spinners. He remained a diligent recorder of thoughts and guidelines, touchstones and daily life details, plot ideas and details, descriptions, and more and more and more in his notebooks, not for posterity, but to help himself to prevent that deadly blank page. He defeated writer's block. Some days he may have been off, way off, down in the dumps off, but overall, he succeeded at his goal of a consistent output of stories. What were those numbers from the first part? 66,000 words per week, 140 published titles, of which 100 sold over 1 million copies each. And so prolific, he had to hide his identity from editors with pen names. Let me give you one last set of numbers. Remember, Gardner started pursuing writing in 1921, in his early 30s. He sent his last manuscript to his publisher, on July 7, 1969, 49 years of writing. That's a writing life. We can only envy. The right focus turns its lens on every writer's secret monster, writer's block. We say the mantra writer's block doesn't exist, but something more than simple disruptions and distractions can interfere with our writing creating insurmountable walls. The right focus in the series Defeat Writer's Block analyzes the three most common types of writer's block and offers solutions to overcome and defeat this monster looming over the writer's desk. The best solution, though, is Leo Tolstoy's mantra, No Days Without Lines, Nulla Die Sine Linea. Make that your own mantra. Information for this series comes from host M.A. Lee's guidebook, Think Like a Pro, a new advent for writers, showcasing seven lessons to change your perspective from hobby writer to pro writer. See the show notes for links. Thanks for listening to The Rock Focus, a podcast for writers at all levels, hosted by M.A. Lee from Writers, Inc. Books, assisted by Remy Black and Edie Runes. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Music is licensed through Audio Jungle, called Background Music Loop. Its creator is Alexander Polishchuk, known on Audio Jungle as Plastic 3. The music comes in different iterations. Show notes and resource links for this and other episodes can be found at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Write to us at winkbooks at aol.com when you have questions, comments, and speculations. We will try to answer you as quickly as possible. By the way, we will not mind your email address. That's rude. If you find value in our content, share with your writing friends or write a review. We're small beans here without the advertising budget of the big peeps, and you can make a difference. And whatever occurs, right on.